Well, good morning, everyone. It is a joy to be with you. I uh, am thrilled to be back here in Steubenville. As Scott said, being here was a great joy and a blessing. And you heard Scott's not only been a great mentor and friend and, and really uh, just an elder brother in the Lord, but he was also the best man at my wedding. And I met my wife here at Steubenville. So it's just such a joy to be here to uh, go down to the port and pray at that little chapel, and uh, it just brings back a lot of great memories, so it's a joy to be here. I want to begin in prayer. That way, at least you can say he began well. <laughs> so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious, loving Father in heaven, you have confirmed your prophetic word from of old in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Help us follow the light of that prophetic word with deeper faith and allow us, Lord, by your grace and the gifts of the Spirit to be your prophetic witnesses in a world darkened by error and falsehood. Help us to shine your light and, Lord, to do that, enlighten our minds by the grace of your Spirit in order to enkindle in our hearts a deeper love for you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, I love the topic that Scott put out for this conference on the prophetic word. And my talk right now is going to be is Jesus as prophet. Now, I'm going to not... I'm going to talk about this, Jesus as a prophet, in a little bit different way than you've heard. We've heard a lot about Jesus as the object of prophecy. That is, the Old Testament being fulfilled in Christ, in his life, in his words, and his deeds. But I'm going to now take us to that next step and look at Jesus as a prophet. Jesus speaks prophecies that will be fulfilled outside of the New Testament. And we're going to look at Jesus as the subject of prophecy, that is, Jesus as prophet. And the prophecy I'm going to look at in particular, and there's many, but the one I want to focus on is his prophecy about Peter. Now Christ, as St. Augustine said, is the head of the church. But the church is the body. And so prophecy relates to the head, that is, Jesus Christ, but it also relates to the church, which is Jesus' body. And so we're going to look at Peter and the church as the object of prophecy, both in the old and in the new, and afterwards in the life of the church. And I think what that'll do is give us a a sense that the church isn't simply something that follows after Jesus, but that the church follows from Jesus' divine will and mission. And that will be an important distinction because today many people think of the church as organized religion that's not that great, flawed with all kinds of sinners and scandals. And yet, the church, in spite of our sins, has a divine vocation and foundation. And that is what this prophetic word that I want to follow, this thread, illustrates and demonstrates, which will confirm our faith and show us and remind us, hopefully, of our divine vocation as the church. So I'm going to follow this theme of Jesus speaking about the sign of Jonah and how that's going to relate to Peter. But before I do that, I want to start with an Old Testament passage that talks about the importance of prophecy for faith. Because there is a predictive element to prophecy, although it doesn't exhaust the meaning of prophecy, And that predictive element is unique because as God will say through the prophet Isaiah, who can declare a thing before it happens but God alone? And when we see prophecies spoken and fulfilled, only God can do that. Only God can do that. And so One of the themes throughout the second half of Isaiah, starting in Isaiah 40, verse 18 and following, is this theme of who is like the Lord God of Israel. 
the gods of the nations are no gods. They're idols. Because what distinguishes the God of Israel from all other gods and idols, from all other wise men and women, is that God foretells an event before it even happens. And so I'll just pick up that thread in two passages now. One is from Isaiah 41, verse 26 and 27. And God says, who declared it from the beginning that we might know? And before time that we might say he is right. There was none who declared it, none who proclaimed, none who heard your words. But I first have declared and declared it to Zion. And I have given it to Jerusalem to be a herald of good tidings. So God declares what he is going to do beforehand. And who does he declare it to? Zion, Jerusalem. In other words, the people of God, the church. And that's why the people of God is to be a herald of good tidings. Basar in Hebrew, which means euangelion in Greek. Good news, gospel, right? So the good news before it is an event, is predicated and foretold by God. Now, all journalists compete with one another to break a story. And the best news companies are those who have breaking news. Well, guess what? You have to break the news after the news has happened, unless you're God. (laughs) You kind of have the early scoop. And this is what God says over and over again in these early chapters in in the 40s of Isaiah. And in chapter 42, verse 8, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and the new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. I tell you of them. Now, St. Jerome said that Isaiah was the fifth gospel because it describes so detailed in such a precise and powerful way the life of Jesus Christ. It is striking to read the word of Isaiah and to see the life of Jesus is to have your faith confirmed. But there's more. But this gives us the principles. Before something takes place, I, I declare it. Now I want to turn to Jesus as a prophet, because Jesus as a prophet won't be simply like a prophet like Isaiah, because Jesus himself will speak in the first person, predicting things. In other words, Jesus will take the voice of Yahweh, and just as Yahweh declared things beforehand in the Old Testament, foretelling the new, Jesus himself, in the New Testament, will foretell and predict what will happen in the new covenant era in the life of the church. He will foretell. Now one of the things he foretells is the destruction of the temple, which again seems impossible even to his disciples to foretell that the greatest building structure ever built is going to be cast down one stone upon another. And that happens exactly 40 years after Jesus predicts it. In 70 AD, the Romans destroy Jerusalem and the temple. Fulfillment. But there's another fulfillment prophecy of Jesus that I think is even bigger and more audacious. And that is his prophecy about Peter. And to talk about that prophecy, I want to take us to Matthew 16. And I'm going to take us to a couple passages that you've heard a lot. Peter gets the keys of the kingdom. But I'm not going to talk about the keys because you know about that story. I'm going to talk about a small thread that prophetically foretells Peter's destiny and the destiny of the Catholic Church. But let's start with the beginning of chapter 16. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees have gathered together and they've asked Jesus for a sign. Show us a sign that we may believe. And Jesus' response in verse 4 is rather stunning. A bit politically incorrect, you might say. He says, a sign, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Ouch. Right? Wow. 
An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign shall be given this generation except the sign of Jonah. Now, first off, let's just reflect on what does it mean? I, I, I was always taken aback by an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. That always kind of arrests me because I like signs, <laughs> right? But it, reflecting on that, why is it that an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign? Well, first off, those who are adulterous are not pure in heart. And Jesus already earlier said, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, that the pure in heart shall see God. And here they have, show us a sign. But Jesus says, you, you don't even read the signs of the times. In other words, this adulterous, sinful generation doesn't see the signs that Jesus is manifesting. Why don't they see it? Because they're an adulterous generation. Because of their impurity. They can't discern in the interior the movements of the Spirit and the voice of God. And so they're blind even to the external signs. They can't see in the external events the true meaning of what God the Father is doing in the life of Christ. So what sign can Jesus show them who are blinded by their impurity and their passions? by their sin. Sin blinds us. In fact, that's one of the major themes of Isaiah 40 through 45, is how Israel is blind and deaf because of their hardness of heart. So how do we see and hear? How do we discern these signs? Well, the one sign that will be irrefutable to these blind and deaf and hard-hearted folk will be the sign of Jonah. And Jesus here leaves the crowd. He goes into the boat with the disciples. And then later on, in verse 13, he comes to Bethsaida. And he heads up from Bethsaida up to Caesarea Philippi. And as he goes up the valley of the Hula Valley, which goes from Bethsaida straight north to Caesarea Philippi, and this is in the district of Philip, the brother of Herod Antipater, the two sons, surviving, two of the surviving sons of Herod the Great. And as he goes up the Hula Valley, there's a road that goes down that valley that follows the Jordan River. And they're following all the way up to the district of Caesarea Philippi where the Jordan River has its source. And as they're going up, Jesus asks them a question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And then you get the first Gallup poll on Jesus. Right? Some say a prophet. Some say John the Baptist come back from the dead. 15% undecided, right? And of course, the Gallup poll, completely wrong. And then Jesus turns the question and says, who do you say that I am? And Peter pipes up. And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now the meaning of Peter's answer struck me when I first went to Israel. And I had studied uh, summer there at Hebrew University to take my crash, couple crash courses in Hebrew. And when I got up to Caesarea Philippi, I was excited because I heard that there's a big rock and that there's a great abyss of a cave right where this happened. And when I got there, being, as St. Jerome says, in the fifth gospel, opened my eyes in a way that study and reading passages about this couldn't do. Because I saw that there wasn't one rock, but there was a cliff. And right along this cliff, there was a cave, a small cave from which a spring came that was the font of the Jordan River. But that cave wasn't a great abyss. It went down about 10 feet. So I was like, wow, that was a little bit of a disappointment. But then I realized that in Jesus' day, they wouldn't have seen the cave because there was a big building in front of the cave. And that building's in ruins now, but I had read about that town of Caesarea Philippi and the archeology, span and I reflected on it, and all of a sudden it dawned on me the significance of what Peter said. Because 
there was a big, big building there. In fact, it was the pride of Philip's territory. Philip put on his coins, after his second coin, and his second coin that he minted on, all of his coins had the image of this building on every coin he did after his first. And what was that building? His father built it, Herod the Great. Because in 20 BC, Caesar Augustus visited that territory, and he gave that territory as a gift to Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was so grateful to his great Roman patron, Caesar, that he built a temple in honor of Caesar Augustus in Caesarea Philippi, naming the town after Caesar as well. And there was this great temple, and in the temple was a statue of the goddess Rome and Caesar Augustus. Two sta pagan statues, idols, to the Roman imperial cult. And of course, the Roman imperial cult had started about seven years earlier, in 27 BC, when the Roman Senate voted Caesar Augustus as Augustus and gave him the title Augustus, which means one worthy of worship, because he had taken the title Son of God, because he got the Roman Senate to vote that his, fa his uncle, Julius, was a god, his adopted father. And the Roman Senate didn't think that Julius was a god, but they said he's dead, so what does, difference does it make? So they voted him a god. And Augustus, who was the most savvy politician of the ancient world, got the Roman Senate to vote his adopted father a god, and then after they did that, he said, well, guess what that makes me? Son of God. And he took that title, and he put it on his coins. Divi Filius, son of God. Temples then were erected in honor of him, one of which was erected in Caesarea Philippi. Now, Jesus takes his disciples up to the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he asks the question, who do you say that I am? And as they get to the district of Caesarea Philippi, what would they see? It dawned on me standing there that the dominant building was the temple to Caesar Augustus. And what does Peter say, looking at that temple, standing in this district, and in the, in the city outskirts? What does Peter say? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, living God is interesting. And I know from my studies that living is a modifier used in the Old Testament and used by Jews to show that the God of Israel is a true and living God, unlike the idols that are carved and made of wood and stone and gold. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear, as Isaiah says in Isaiah 45 and 44. So the point is living is always a modifier for God when there's a contradistinction to pagan idols. So Peter uses the term living God. Why? because there's pagan idols at hand. Idols that worship Caesar. And the imperial cult that worships Caesar as a son of God. And notice what Peter says. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Unlike Caesar, who's the son of a dead God. We, you are the son of a living God, Rome, and its emperor is the son of a dead God. Wow. Do you see the difference between a living God and a dead God? Between Jesus and Caesar. And Jesus, I believe, asked this question prophetically. Not when he's down in Jerusalem, not when he's in Galilee, but when he's up at Caesarea Philippi. That's when he asked the question to the disciples. And Peter professes in the face of the Roman imperial cult, that Jesus is the true Son of God, not Caesar. That is why Jesus asked the question there, before the temple, because Jesus knows prophetically the mission he's going to have for Peter, to send Peter ultimately to Rome, to send him to evangelize the Roman Empire, 
where the fastest growing religion in the first century is the Roman imperial cult, the worship of Caesar as the son of God. And he's going to send his disciples out and Peter to proclaim a different Lord and a different Son of God in the face of Rome. And Jesus knows that that will lead to persecution and hostility. But here, Peter makes the profession in the face of the imperial cult. That will be prophetic of Peter's destiny, but there's more. And I want to look at the phrases that are used here. Of course, Peter professes, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Notice, Peter's perception of who Jesus is comes interiorly from the Father. Peter has the purity of heart to see and hear God. Unlike the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees at the beginning, who look for outward signs but can't discern and hear the voice of the Father. Notice that Peter stands in contradistinction to the leadership at the beginning of the chapter. Now, notice, by the way, that Jesus said no sign would be given but the sign of Jonah. And Matthew, a master storyteller here, leaves it open to what the sign of Jonah means. But then just a little bit later in the story, later in the chapter, Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah. Here we have the name Jonah again. What does that mean? Well, I used to read this thinking that, well, Simon bar Jonah, that Jonah was the name of Peter's father. But I was wrong. Because we know from the Gospel of John the name of Peter's father, and it's not Jonah. What's the, Peter's father's name? It's John. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 42, when Jesus first meets Peter, he says, So you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Kephas, rock, in the Aramaic. And then later on in John 21, verse 15, Jesus, at the charcoal fire, after the resurrection, Peter comes in from fishing, and Jesus says to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he says it again in verse 16, Simon, son of John. And he says it again in verse 17, Simon, son of John. So clearly, the father of Peter is John. And Jonah is not a shortened form of John. Yohanan, when it's shortened, is Yohanai. So Jonah is not the shortened form. And Jonah is an extraordinarily rare name for Jews, believe it or not. Now there's the prophet Jonah, but there's very few Jews named Jonah. In fact, you could go in the Old Testament era, all we know is Jonah, who's named Jonah. And then if you look even th up to 300 years from the first century, all of Second Temple Judaism, 300 years after Peter, we don't know of a single Jewish male named Jonah. The only Jews that we know named Jonah, two of them are females. Because Yonah, Jonah means dove in Hebrew. And I guess a lot of Jewish men did not want to name their, their sons dove. <laughs> so Yonah is an extraordinary rare name. And so when, and notice what we get in the Gospel of Matthew. In the Greek, it preserves the original phrasing of Peter in the Aramaic, or of the words of Jesus to Peter in Aramaic. Blessed are you, Simon Bar, which is the Aramaic word for son. Simon Bar Jonah. Bar Jonah. Why Bar Jonah, son of Jonah? Because Peter will be a son of Jonah. Now we know that the sign of Jonah relates to Jesus because in Matthew 12, Jesus said, a greater than Jonah is here, referring to himself. So Jesus is the new Jonah, but guess what? Peter gets associated closely with Jesus. The church 
is always close to Christ. So Jesus will be the new Jonah, but Peter and the church will be the bar Jonah, the son of Jonah. What does that mean, bar Jonah? Well, let's think about that. I mean, we know that Jesus, as he says in other times, will be like, the, uh, like Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, the belly of the fish. So will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights and rise, referring to the resurrection. But there's more to the story of Jonah, and this is where Peter comes in. Peter will complement and fit. Jesus is the head, the church is the body. Together, there's the fullness of the picture, as Augustine says. Now, Jonah was a prophet sent by God to Nineveh, the capital of the enemy of Israel. And Jonah was a prophet from Galilee, which is interesting and unique. Now, later on in John chapter 7, I think it's around verse 42, the Pharisees say, how could Jesus be a prophet? No prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Oh, well, actually there was, Jonah. So they don't know their Bible very well. So Peter is from Galilee, like Jonah. And Jesus is calling Peter to a prophetic mission. He will be a bar Jonah, a disciple in the spirit of the prophet Jonah. And Jonah is sent to Nineveh, and Nineveh is the capital of the enemy of Israel. And God says, I want you to preach repentance, lest I destroy them. And Jonah thinks about this and says, okay, that's our enemy. God's going to destroy them unless I preach. I think I'm going to go in a different direction. <laughs> so Peter heads off the opposite direction of Nineveh, which is to the east. He heads west. And he goes to a town called what? Joppa, where he gets a boat. And he heads west as far west as he can in the Mediterranean, to get as fast and as far as possible away from Nineveh. Now, that's interesting, because that's the only time in the Old Testament that the town Joppa is mentioned. But we find Joppa in the story of Acts. And who's in Joppa in Acts 9? Peter, the bar Jonah. Now, you have to think about that. So let's turn to Acts chapter 9 and see what happens there. Now, there's two stories that happen, first in Lydda, which is in the outskirts of Joppa, where Peter heals a paralytic named Aeneas, and he rises him up who could not walk, which is an echo to the resurrection. And then he goes to Joppa because a disciple who is famous for her acts of charity and her almsgiving has died. And, of course, her name is Tabitha which, or Dorcas, and they, call, they ask Peter to come, and Peter comes, and her body has been washed and laid out in the upper room. And then Peter goes up there, and he sends everybody out. Peter prays, and what happens? He says, Tabitha, rise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all of Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with Simon, a tanner. So notice we get resurrection, which is a theme of Jonah. Jonah, three days in the belly of the whale, will be a sign of Jesus' resurrection. Peter, as a bar Jonah now, is showing the sign of Jesus by raising up the paralytic, but even more than that, raising up the dead woman, Dorcas. Right? So we see resurrection and rising. And then the next story in chapter, tw uh, chapter 12, well, actually chapter 10. I want to start with chapter 10. We're at Caesarea, Maritima, another city on the coast where Herod the Great built a temple to Caesar Augustus on the seaport. And there, there's a Roman centurion, Cornelius, who's known for his almsgiving and his prayers. He's a God-fearer. He believes in Judaism, even though he's a Gentile. And he's stationed there at Caesarea. And Cornelius is praying, and an angel appears to him and says, Go send to Joppa for one Simon Peter, who's staying at the house of a man named Simon the Tanner. Send for him. So Cornelius sends a couple of his soldiers down to Joppa. 
So then by the end of the next day, Peter is there. And in the midst of the story of Cornelius, we have a vision that Peter has as he's in Joppa. And Peter has this vision of a great sheet. And in that sheet are all these unclean animals for Jews. And he hears a voice from heaven saying, kill and eat. In other words, eat unkosher food. And Peter says, Lord, I've never eaten unkosher food before. And then God has to say it again, slaughter and eat. And then Peter says again, no, no, I, I've never eaten anything unkosher in my life. And then God has to say it a third time. Peter's a little thick. Now, the word for sheet, by the way, Othone in the Greek means a sail. Now that's significant because that's a hint. Because Peter's having this vision of Gentiles being made clean by Christ's death and resurrection in Joppa, the very place where Jonah took a ship with Gentiles in a boat heading west. And Jonah's prophetic mission was not to Israel, but to the Gentiles. And not just to any Gentiles, but to the enemy, the very enemy of Israel. And there, there's a sheet, a, a ship sail with all this unclean food. And Peter sees this vision. And then at the end of the vision, God says, someone's coming at the door, go with them. And then all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. There's Roman soldiers. That would cause a bit of a panic. And they're looking for Peter. Panic. But Peter's calm because he's got the word from the Lord to go with them. So Peter goes with them up to Caesarea, to the household of Cornelius. And the next day, he's presented before Cornelius. And Cornelius says, you know, I had this vision. Uh, I was told to send for you. And the Lord asked me to send for you, so please tell us. You have a word from the Lord, a message. And so Peter begins to preach. And Peter says, uh, you know, he, he's amazed by this. And he says, I perceive that God shows no partiality between Gentile and Jew now, right? And so uh, he says in verse 34 of Acts 10, truly I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable. You know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching the good news of peace by Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all, a title, by the way, used for Caesar. Notice Peter is unafraid to use the great acclaims of Caesar that show forth his divinity to claim divinity for Jesus. He is the Lord of all. The word which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, beginning with Galilee. And he, Peter gives him the whole story of Jesus, and then they see that the Spirit has fallen upon Cornelius and his household, and Peter says, can water be kept from baptizing them? And so the first Gentiles are baptized. The first Gentiles are baptized. Right there, at the end of chapter 10 of Acts. Now, in chapter 11, Peter goes back and tells the crowds in Jerusalem, everyone's astonished that Gentiles are now going to be included in the people of God and baptized and receive the Holy Spirit, which is the prophetic promise to Israel, that Israel's sons and daughters and Joel would prophesy and be given the gifts of the Spirit, but now we see that God's liberality knows no bounds. The Spirit will be given to the Gentiles as well. Now, what's significant is in chapter 12, Peter gets arrested. Maybe this word of Gentiles really upsets the Jews so much that they go to Herod Agrippa, the successor of Herod Antipater, and Herod Agrippa arrests Peter and throws him in jail. And the angel of the Lord comes at night, as you know that story, and even though there's many, many soldiers, even though Peter's chained to them, they all fall asleep. The angel takes Peter out. They go to the house of John Mark, where the community's gathered, and they give thanks and praise, and it's, a, and, it, and it's an exciting escape. But they know Peter is hunted. So then we're told in Acts 12, uh, verse 7, that Peter goes to another place. Now, it's odd that Luke, who loves to tell you about geography and location, throughout the story of Acts, Luke is always saying, and then they went from there to you know, Joppa, to Lydda, to 
you know, back to Jerusalem. He's always giving you geographical details. I think Luke, who was a physician and a scholar, loved maps. He's one of those map nerds, right? And he loved geography and place. But here he doesn't tell us a place. That's extraordinarily odd for Luke. Why doesn't he tell us where Peter went? Well, St. Jerome and the tradition all says there's a reason why he doesn't name the place. Because Peter's a wanted man. And the place he goes to is Rome, the capital. That's where the tradition picks up. So tradition picks up from Scripture that Peter goes to Rome. But I would say, and I want to pick up with the tradition, but I want to show that the tradition is rooted and confirmed by the Word of God in the Scriptures. We have a couple clues that Peter goes to Rome in the Scriptures. For example, in 1 Corinthians, we're told that there's divisions and rivalry in Corinth in the church, and Paul says, look, some are saying that they're from the party of Peter, others are with the party of Paul. But notice, how could there be a party of Peter in Corinth? Well, we know that some of the Christians in Corinth came from Rome when Claudius had an edict against the Jews, and all Jews and Jewish Christians had to leave Rome in 49 AD. And a couple of those Christians were Aquila and Priscilla. They worked in Rome and then had to move to Corinth. And so we know that there's this Peter party. What does it mean, the Peter party? Priscilla and Aquila were probably baptized and evangelized by Peter. So you have the group that belongs to Peter. And it seems to belong with who was baptized by who. Seems to be part of the factions, as, as Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 and following. But there's other elements in Paul's letter to the Romans. He mentions that he wants to go to Rome not to lay a foundation where another man has built, reference to Peter being in Rome before him, but he wants to go to Rome on his way to Spain, to new mission ground. Right? So in Romans 15, there seems to be a reference to Peter already being ahead of Paul in Rome. But then let's take the Roman tradition. In Rome, there's a church that I love to go to when I do pilgrimage there that's built over a first century home where Peter lived in Rome, according to tradition. And it's the church of Santa Pudenciana. Now, Senator Pudens was one of the hundreds of Roman senators at the time, one of the 400, one of 400 Roman senators. And the early Christian tradition says that Pudens became a Christian and that he received Peter and he hosted Peter. Now when people go to Rome, they always go to St. Peter's Basilica, which is where Peter died. He spent maybe an hour breathing there. No one goes to the church where he lived and did his ministry in Rome, which is Santa Pudenciana's, which is just down the hill in a short walk from St. Mary Major's. Now, the fascinating thing about this church, it's a gem, a hidden gem. You go in there, and it has the oldest mosaic of any church in Rome. That is not Byzantine mosaic, but it's Roman-esque mosaic, dating to about 390. And the artist had been to the Holy Land, because the artist in the mosaic shows all the churches of St. Helena that she had built after the conversion of her son, Constantine. And it shows all these churches in the Holy Land. But the more important thing it shows is all the disciples, the 12 apostles, in Roman senatorial togas. Because the church is built over the the house of Senator Pudens. And you can do a scavy tour and see the ruins below. Now, the fascinating thing about those ruins below is that they found a brick. And they dated that brick to the first century. All that brick of the foundation. So it was, it was a first century home of a wealthy Roman. And we know in the second century, the Roman baths of this estate were turned into a baptistry with ancient Christian mosaics. So we know in the early second century, this was a Christian hub of activity. But they found a brick from the first century with a name, Pudens. And that was the custom when you built a house to put the name of the builder at the foundation and in the corner, you would, print the, you would put the name and burn it into the brick. And I've seen that brick, and I've touched it with the name Pudens. 
Now, I was giving a teaching there years ago, and I had a great uh, Italian guide with me, Esther, who had a doctorate uh, in art history and history, and she had been a guide her whole life. And I was describing this, and she got up in front of my group, and she goes, but this is just a tradition. We don't really know if Putin's was a Christian. It's just a tradition. And this is unfortunately how a lot of people now view tradition with great skepticism. But I said, no, Esther, it's not just a tradition that Putin's was a Christian and hosted Peter. We have a first century source that mentions P Putin's as a Christian. She said, no, 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 no. I've, I've studied here. I got a doctorate. I've guided here. I know the pastor here. There's no, no, there's, there's no evidence that Putin's was a Christian. I said, no, 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 Esther, I, I, I've got it with me. I've got a first century source that mentions Putin's as a Christian. And she's like, no way. I said, I opened up my Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 21. Paul, writing from Rome in captivity, sends a letter to Timothy, his right-hand man who's in Ephesus. And Paul knows his end is at hand. So he writes to Timothy for him to come back to Rome. Now, Timothy had been with Paul earlier in Rome in Paul's first visit to Rome. But now, at the end of his life, with Nero's persecution, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, make every effort to come before winter because he can't sail around Greece in the winter. In the Mediterranean, it's too dangerous. Make every effort to come before winter. And then he says, and Eubulus sends greetings to you, as does Pudens and Linus and Claudia. Now that's an interesting group of Roman Christians. Linus. You ever hear that name besides Snoopy? Where does Linus come in? He's the second pope. He's the second pope. And as pope, you got to host the church. you got to have a big house. He's a Roman aristocrat who's a convert. Linus, the second pope. And who's mentioned right before Linus? Pudens, the Roman senator who was a Christian, who hosted Peter and Paul, whose house and home became the center of activity in Rome. Now, how would Peter get to know a Roman senator? How would he do that? That's the question. And it dawned on me, thinking and reflecting on this and praying about this, that I, all of a sudden it hit me. Acts chapter 10 gives us the clue. It gives us the answer, I believe. Acts chapter 10, Peter meets a very important Roman who's a Roman aristocrat, who's a very powerful, wealthy Roman. He's not just a Roman centurion, but remember, he's famous in all of Israel for his almsgiving. He was a very wealthy man. In fact, Julian the Apostate mentions that the Christians exaggerate their influence on Roman aristocrats because there's only two major aristocrats who became Christians, Sergius Paulus and Cornelius. So even Julian the Apostate gives witness that Cornelius was of the equestrian rank and of a high Roman family. Now, Cornelius hosts Peter because Peter baptizes him by God's providence. And Peter baptizes his disciples, Cornelius. Peter is in Jerusalem. He has to flee after he escapes from prison, thanks to God. And he goes to another place. Well, where would he go? He would go to Caesarea. Because he has a friend there who's powerful and influential, Cornelius. And what does Cornelius do? Cornelius is from, guess where? Luke tells you. Cornelius is from the Italian cohort. A little detail. In other words, Cornelius is from Rome. And we know that he's a god -fearer. So what that means is Cornelius, who is from Rome, wealthy and powerful, a Roman officer, probably beginning his career up the ranks, and he wants to be stationed in, the, in Palestine and in the Holy Land because he believes in Judaism. He was a god fearer in Rome. And we know that the Jewish population in Rome was very significant and that they proselytized many wealthy Romans. In fact, Cicero says, has any Roman not been proselytized by a Jew? So Cornelius was a god-fearing Roman aristocrat 
And I suggest to you that when Peter goes up to Caesarea Philippi, or Caesarea Maritima, to Cornelius, wanted as a wanted man and a death sentence by Herod Agrippa, Cornelius says, I'll send you to Rome on the next ship, and I'm going to send you with a letter of recommendation to my friend Pudens that you have to meet. And all of a sudden, Scripture takes us right up to the point of tradition, and they fit together. Scripture and tradition fit together hand and glove. Now, I believe Peter then goes to Rome, Corn Cornelius sends him along, and then when he gets there, he meets Pudens, thanks to Cornelius. Pudens probably also was a god -fearer. He hears the word of God, he converts, and he becomes the center of activity for the Christian faith growing in Rome. And it grows quickly in Rome. So quickly in Rome that Nero can scapegoat the Christians, see them as a threat, and does a major persecution. So that's how Peter gets to, in fact, Prudenciana, the church, is named after Senator Putin's daughter, Prudenciana, who, because she's a powerful Roman aristocratic family of a senator, can bury the dead Christians that Nero persecutes. And she's protected, and in that church is a cistern where they buried many of the first martyrs under Nero. But there's more to the story. Because now we find Peter in Rome, and that, that fulfills, the tradition shows us the history of Christianity shows us that Jesus' prophetic prophecy was fulfilled because Jesus said back in Caesarea Philippi, the city in Palestine named for Caesar, with the temple to Caesar, where Peter professes, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Because Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, you're going to be a prophet like Jonah, and I'm sending you not just to the Gentiles, but I'm sending you to the capital of the enemy of Israel like Jonah. And you are going to preach to, at the capital of the enemy of Israel, and they are going to repent and believe. And Cornelius, who's from Rome, and Pudens, who's in Rome, become the first fruits, the first of the new Nineveh to be converted at the preaching of the new Jonah. And that is why in the catacombs, there's over 300 images of the prophet Jonah being swallowed by the belly of the whale. And in all the earlier burial places, one of the most popular and favorite images of the early Christians is the prophet Jonah. Because Jonah being thrown out of the belly of the whale, naked, signifies divinity for the Greeks and Romans, nakedness. But now this new nakedness signifies new birth of baptism because the Christians would be naked when they stripped for full immersion. And that nakedness of baptism shows us the new birth of resurrection. So Jonah coming out of the belly of the whale became an emblem of baptism and death and resurrection. And it became a popular image. But not only a popular image, when they found the tomb of Peter at the end of World War II, there was two images from the early, early second century, probably some of the oldest images of Christian art next to the tomb of Peter. And one of those images was a man fishing and two fish with a line. And of course, that's Peter the fisherman. And then the other image was a man being thrown out of a boat with a great big monster fish swallowing him up. And that's Jonah. Because the early Christians knew that death and resurrection was a sign of Jonah, and Jesus was the new Jonah, but Peter was the bar Jonah. And this imagery of Jonah was most popular in Rome. You don't find it in other cities, in other places of Christian worship and Christian fellowship as much and predominantly as it dominates in Rome. Why does the image of Jonah dominate in Rome? Because those pagan Romans who were converts to Christianity knew that they were the new Nineveh. And that Peter sent to them was the new Jonah. And they knew that that church was a witness. Because it's a remarkable prophecy of Jesus. It's a ridiculous prophecy that the capital of Rome was going to convert. For Jesus to say that, and all, document in all four Gospels in the first century, that Rome would convert is ridiculous prophecy. And it's irrefutable 
No historian, no scholar in the world can contradict the historicity of Jesus predicting this in the first century, and it's fulfilled by the fourth century. The church in Rome knew that they were witnesses to Jonah. And so in the Sistine Chapel, the greatest Catholic artist of all time, Michelangelo, as he does the the chapel for the Pope, and as he designs it, the largest of the seven prophets, the largest figure of all the Sistine Chapel is the prophet Jonah. Because Michelangelo went to the catacombs and he studied early Christian art, and he was also on a Bible study (laughs) with a cardinal. Some thought he was, had Protestant tendencies because he was in a Bible study. But when the car, a cardinal's leading the Bible study, it's kind of hard to think that, right? So here's the image. Jonah looking back over the ceiling. And Jonah has the fish. And Jonah is the largest figure. Why? Because it's death and resurrection, which is the heart of the gospel. And the call for repentance, which is the heart of the gospel. And as he's looking up, Jonah's kind of admiring Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. You could look at it that way, but Michelangelo wasn't that vain. Jonah's looking at the Sistine Chapel. He's looking at salvation history from Genesis all the way through, and he's seeing God's plan of salvation prophetically fulfilled. And what's more, if you look at where Jonah is, he looks like he's about to slip off and fall down. And he's on the, the south, southeast corner of the chapel. And on that southern part, there's one place right below Jonah, liturgically situated. And where is Jonah liturgically situated in the chapel? He is right over the chair of Peter. Michelangelo knew his story. Now Esther, I want to end with just this, for the last minute. Esther when she didn't believe about this, when I explained the story of Putin's being a Christian, and it's in 2 Timothy, she was blown away. And she went through a deep conversion. And, and six months later, one of, my, uh, one of our, our faculty who was with me, who was studying in Rome, Ben Akers, ran into her on a bus in Rome. And she said, oh, how is Tim the Biblicist, Dr. Tim the Biblicist? That's the Italian word for scripture scholar. And he said, oh, he's, he's doing fine. She said, oh, please tell Dr. Tim that since his trip, I went out after his trip and I bought a Bible for the first time in my life. And I've been reading it every day since. And it's changed my life. My friends, she had a doctorate and she's a Catholic in Rome. And she didn't know the Catholic story. From scripture to tradition, from Jesus to Peter, the sign of Jonah. But she discovered it and her heart came afire. And she went back to the word of God and she read the tradition in a different way. And that's what Michelangelo painted on the ceiling. And that is our story. We have to regain our Catholic story because the prophecy confirms your faith so that you can be witnesses to the good news of Jesus Christ. That is what God the Father has called you here this weekend for, this week. That you may hear and have faith and not fear. And in Isaiah 44, verse 7 and 8, God says, I am he who calls things from the beginning. I foretell them that you may not be afraid. Amen. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, you have made clear, you have declared beforehand what you would do, both in the old for the new and the new for the now. Give us faith, Lord a faith that gives us courage to be your witnesses, to know our Catholic story, and to proclaim it to the world. We pray this in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.